Hello and welcome back to SPECT. Today I'm going to be talking about the Psychic Awakening Blood of Vow book. I first bought this book when it first came out and only now I'm going to tell you my take on it. Now you could say like, hey, why wait so long to talk about it? Why after being so excited about both your main armies being in one book that you took so long? Way to Mr. Hype Train. Alright, 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 I hear you. I'm here now. The reason for the delay is that the Blood of Bow Psychic Awakening is one of the most confusing and conflicting supplements that I've seen so far. Not for the rules, but for the overall intent. The swing from doom to hope. So let's start from the beginning and I'll explain what I mean. This book presents you with a highly contrasted piece of artwork, stark white, strong colour against black hues. It's almost as if Mephisto is gliding from his shadows, cloaked melding as a vampire of old. A bold presentation of the chief librarian Mephisto stands firm, hand raised in a crushing fist empowered with his psychic might. His sword is emblazoned in the other. His massive power armors have lost a lot of his signature type design from the original. All of this is beautiful until you notice that this is not the only change. It seems that the pathway for the Rubicon has forced a disturbing proportion to Mephiston's head and hands. If you compare the perspective that should be employed to his fist, his body and his head, it's all wrong. His hands should be bigger and his head also should be slightly larger. I'm not talking classic Jack Kirby hyperheroic distortions. But when you compare the artwork against Mephisto's new model, or one that's similar, it becomes a lot clearer. The proportions displayed in the book are more akin to Rob Liefeld's artwork. Rob Liefeld's artwork was exciting at the time, full of action, but it hid a lot of artistic sins. A simple way of putting it is the details are fantastic but the structure is all wrong. Now that style worked for a while until you notice these distortions especially when you make the comparisons to an artist like the masterful Jim Lee. Same detail level plus amazing structure makes his artwork legendary. Taking that understanding to the cover, it becomes clear and now I can't unsee it. To be honest, a simple double check before signing off the artwork would have given the artist a chance to alter the image and I believe they probably would have done so. Even a simple digital alteration could have saved it. Or save time, stay true to the new model, and just conjoin the advertising for the Primaris and Mephiston and the Psychic Awakening book alike. Now we'll put links to the artists in question below so you can see better. Opening the cover takes us to the standard splash page that we're used to in each codex. It's a good start to give us something we're familiar with. Contents and intro set the tone, and the unfolding story of the Battle of the Red Scar, missions, updated rules of Blood Angels, and the Flesh Terrors, relics, stratagems, and rules, alongside some content for the Tyranid Hive Fleets, and their customizations. It's so exciting to think that I'll be bringing my Tyranids in line with the Space Marines so I can play them and have a fun, challenging game. A simple look at the content would have given me a hint of how it was really going to go. I can already see 35 plus pages for the Blood Angels and only 11 for the Tyranids. On to the narrative. The ongoing conflict, Warzone Bow, set against the backdrop of ever present Cicatrix Maledictum. The planet map highlights the expansive Empyrean body floating in the red light of the deadly star system. With the terse tendrils trailing to each heavily populated planet, the story draws you in quickly and you're gifted with a deep sense of doom. This is a signature of the 40k universe, but I feel that they've made a small change, a difference, and that's hope. The conversation between Gulliman and Dante promotes the Rubicon Primaris process. It contains the idea of a reclamation of the Red Scar region. The ongoing narrative for the next few pages mimics the contrasted theme from the beginning, going between doom and hope. Following the emotional push-pull, the Echoes of Awakening story is a grim insight to the cursed lives of people within that damned location. I thought wrongly that I would get a reprieve from the dread, 
Now, that was my mistake. All it took was a few short sentences to see myself within that scenario. A few more pages and I would have been fully entrenched. Probably succumb into the shadows of the wall. On to the conflict. The battle and the strategies. After recently planned devastation of Baal, multiple missions each time, I was expected to have the same ultimate series of battles between these two old enemies. One is the number of missions I was given. One. Seriously? With a few strategies to add to that, it's such wasted potential. This shows me that they had less care for this book than an 8 page free supplement. Again, taking away my hope. On to the meat of this book. We start off with a blanket update for the Blood Angels and weapons. We get a beautiful picture of Mephisto, and now this one has the correct proportions and cries the strength of the model. Mephiston, Astaroth, Lamartes, Chaplains and the Death Company have been updated to the Primera standards, forging them into the new snarling teeth of the Imperium. Strangely enough though, the Sangri Priest has not had the same update. I did hope that the Librarian Dreadnought would also be moved into something slightly different and be given a redemptor chassis, but there's still time for that yet. Shadow Spheres strike teams and models are here too. I did notice that the Flamer and Heavy Flamer is still not available as standard Primaris equipment and I do expect to see them in the Blood Angels Codex 2.0. New abilities and Warlord traits are welcomed. Warlords now have access to Vanguard tactics and I can see target priority helping a large squad of Illuminators. I think my favourite Warlord trait is the Lord of Deceit. Imagine deploying to protect yourself from a flank of Death Come for unit with jump packs, only to have them moved and redeployed in a different location before they start their first movement. Before play, they are going to eradicate you. And I'm very happy with this. On to three pages of strategies and a page of observation disciplines psychic abilities. All staple and to be expected and then we have the sweet spot, the Blood Angels Litanies of Battle. With these litanies the damage potential of all Blood Angels is pushed through the roof. Now if this is the only reason you want to get this book then it's the wisest decision as a Blood Angels player you will make this edition. Strangely enough relics are Primaris killers there is a lot of 2 damage weapons and I was also surprised to see the return of digital weapons in the special issue war gear section. With that bonus attack it can make all the difference. We have 2 pages in the books dedicated to flesh terrors. And I would have loved to see something in here for the lamenters but there's no luck there. They have added a name generator for kill team and a simple points value to make up the last 4 pages dedicated to the 9th legion. It's a fitting end to the section and closes out the rewarding feeling of reading a codex. On to the Tyranids. A colourful jewel splash page calls us into the hive mind and it's kind of nice. But as nice as it is, I'm aware that 2 pages have been taken from the Tyranids arsenal. So on to the obligatory mini contents page. That's another page gone too. Bio artifacts are next. Mm, well, disappointment is the easiest way to sum them up. Rather than have the ancient hive mind make up something better, I have a few ideas in a previous video I'll link. We're stuck with either poor imitations of a high fleet adaptions, or they are designed to enhance two of the most overused and played Tyranid high fleets. I mean, be down with a fluff G-dub, huh? Strategies gives us two pages of creature specific buffs. You have to be the named unit to really gain the effects of these strategies. If you have the units in question, there's a lot of clever stackable tactics that you can play. The only thing failing is most of the units in question are those that no one really uses, 
or there's a better alternative to build with the same kit that's more efficient. These strats are an obviously buff to mostly unused models. So the only real strategy in this section is to boost sales. High Fleet Adaptions is a new section that I was hoping Tyranid players will be rewarded for their loyalty. It even starts off with the idea that the Tyranid race is a G-Salt super organism, deploying an ending morphic traits. So after years of keeping the same High Fleet and buying the swarms of bugs, I was going to get an update from my army, a new addition to our standard abilities. Those High Fleets that were custom made would then be given restricted access just like a successor chapter of the Space Marines will be. But this is where Games Workshop is kicking loyal Tyranid players when they're down. These new adaptions that can make a world of difference during a game is only for the new custom Tyranid armies. These adaptions make your army more survivable and when combined with the right strategies, a Tyranid army can now be a fun challenge. I know people wouldn't mind if I just said that these models were High Fleet X and here's their adaptions, but I've never seen anyone field a Blood Angel and claim that it was an Ultramarine. It breaks the immersion of the game. All the excitement was gone, hope lost, until I remembered the crypt strain of High Fleet Leviathan. They are, in effect, painted the same way as High Fleet Leviathan, apart from a single yellow line from the crest of the head to the lower carapace. That particular strain even showed traits from the new adaptions lists. Then I got it. Morale restored. This is Games Workshop way of bringing a touch of the unpredictability of the Tyranids back to the table. Unlike how the sterile by numbers space marine structures can be. Next thing of value is the adaptive physiology. These abilities give a unit or a single model from your army a special ability. These abilities almost mirror strategies giving you major advantages. The only difference is that rather than lasting one turn and costing a command point, these adaptions last a whole game and cost you your warlord trait. Yes, your warlord trait. You'll have to give up your warlord trait to access these. Now let's face it, most warlord traits for Tyranid players are hot garbage. So the trade is welcome and with a single command point you could gain access to an extra adaptive physiology. On to the psychic powers. One page. One page. So it's back to restricting the Tyranid player. Space Marine chapters have dedicated powers, six of them even for the successor chapters. Tyranid players get one. And the one that they gain is limited to their hive fleet. So we go from pick and choose to you lose. And that's all I'm going to say on that. Name generators. I don't know why. I would have preferred a page about how the mind of the High Fleet is changing due to new interference of the Imperium. Enough said. There's no new points cost, no new models, and there's very few turning pages. But I will admit there is so much play value in them. Overall, I can see what Games Workshop was trying to do. It's a small appetizer for the new inevitable Blood Angels Codex. Too many signature items are still missing from there. And I know Belisarius Core could easily make them all. Dante is missing. Dante's Primaris form, Dante Prime, would happily see me refresh my whole army. And maybe that's what Games Workshop is waiting for, rather than just a single model release like Mephisto. A lot of Blood Angel players think like Gabriel Slef when it comes to Primaris. As far as he's concerned, they must earn his respect, it's not just given. And I don't see Psychic Awakening, Blood of Bow, being a rush to buy unless you're a tournament player. If you run Tyranids, you will see that they're being given a new lease of life, a freedom to mix and change the army abilities as needed. This is more in line with the fluff and makes the army more playable. Now, during my battles and playtesting, it's been a joy. It's almost like I have a new army without the cost. And that's the best I could have hoped for. And that's the key. The conflict between Doom 
and hope is eternal. And it is a trademark of the 40k universe. This has been Specked and that's my review of the Psychic Awakening Blood of Bow book. I hope this has helped you to make a decision if you've been sitting on the fence. Let me know if it does. I've enjoyed my time. I hope you enjoyed yours. Enjoy your week. And as always, PC out.